We're told in the gospel today that Jesus commissioned 72 disciples to go out on mission and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, I was discussing this with Father Dick, who was very argumentative with me. He said there weren't 72. There were only 68. And I said, Father, how do you know this? He goes, because I was there. I think the number 72 just represented the number of people that had gathered around Jesus. I mean, it was early on in his ministry. You can imagine this, right? He had the 12 apostles and these 72. These were the ones that he believed at that time could take on the mission of going to speak in his name and to heal people and touch them and do great things in the name of Jesus. These are the ones he believed at that time would make his mission their own mission. The ones that would have his zeal for souls as their own zeal for souls. So he sent them out and hit the streets. In other words, it was all hands on deck. Everybody who claimed that they were a follower of Jesus in their heart were sincere about it, were sent out. No exception. And when they were sent out, they didn't take anything with them. Remember, Jesus said, don't take a money bag, don't take any sandals or a second tunic, don't take even a walking stick, which was absolute madness in those days to walk around the streets of Palestine with not even a walking stick to ward off the robbers along the way. Nothing. They were to be totally dependent upon the power of Jesus himself working in and through them. They had nothing of their own power to recommend them for the job. They didn't have any strengths and talents, no competencies. Most of them were uneducated people. All they had was faith in their heart, you see. Even in their sins and weaknesses, they were sent out to do great things for God. All of which goes to show that they were this small group of people in love with the Lord Jesus, empowered by him. And they were sent out to a world that was troubled and broken, filled with paganism, Roman Empire stuff, corruption. But you know, their world was not much different than our world is today. And what do they bring to such a world? What do we bring? Because just like the original 72 that were sent out, that number has grown over the millennia. And that number now includes you and me. And what do we bring to the world? that is so broken to what is absolutely a cosmic struggle between light and darkness. St. Paul says it's powers and principalities. Spiritual warfare. Well, I suggest to you that we bring an invitation to faith. That's what we bring. In the midst of doubt and fear and faithlessness and godlessness, we bring faith an invitation to it. We bring an encounter with the living Lord in the face of all this death-dealing stuff around us. We bring a way of living that speaks more about how we care for one another, that we are our brother, sister, and sister's keepers. We bring the very power of God to bear in this world. Pope Francis, you know, speaks a lot about this mission of ours. And he invites us and he challenges each one of us to go out there just like those original 72 so that we can accompany people, so that we can listen to them, so that we can meet them where they're at. He says this, he said, the church in this time of great historical change, is called to offer more evident signs 
of God's presence and closeness. This is not the time to be distracted. On the contrary, we need to be vigilant and to reawaken in ourselves, first of all, the capacity to see what is essential, what really matters. This is a time for the church to rediscover the meaning of the mission entrusted to her by the Lord on Easter. Namely, to be a sign and an instrument of the Father's mercy. Because mercy is what's going to change hearts. That's what happened time and time again in the gospel. These 72 went out in the name of Jesus to tell everybody they met that they're loved more than they deserve. More than they believe they're worthy of being loved. That's what did it. Look at the Gospels. Jesus touches people. He hangs out with sinners. He eats with them. He's crucified for doing all those radical things that no one believes a man of God should do. He does it because that's how you, that's how you reel people in. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, we get such a beautiful glimpse of that in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. That's where, you know, Jesus gives the direct criteria for getting into heaven. He says, you know, when I was hungry, he gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, he gave me something to drink. I was naked and he clothed me, etc., etc. We know that. And conversely, we get there too the criteria for getting to hell. Because when you didn't do any of these things, for the least of my brothers and sisters, you fail to do those things for me, and off you go. There's no other way to interpret that scripture. That's the way it's going to be. And then in the midst of that beautiful Sermon on the Mount, he shares with us, with us the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor and the suffering, those who are hungering, thirsting for what is right, reminding us therein, that God sometimes, and probably more often than not, does his best work in us and through us when we're broken, when we're hurt. Listen to this contemporary version of the Beatitude. Blessed are you who live in a trailer park, who stare at bowls of soup in nursing homes, who eat alone in soup kitchens, who feed your kids with food stamps, who tremble at the sight of your rent bill. Blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, emaciated children in Sudan and Africa and Iraq, who have no clean water, no food, no medicine. Blessed are you, swollen bodies and hollowed eyes. You will be satisfied. Blessed are you lonely widows and widowers, you inmates of mental institutions, you sad foster children, you befuddled heroin addicts. You will be joyful. Blessed are you shunned immigrants, you despised prisoners, you undesirable troublemakers, Rejoice. You will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that the vision of Pope Francis telling us every day to embrace it? To recognize, first of all, like these 72, that none of us can give what we don't have. We can only give what we have. So we need to experience the mercy that God offers so generously and lovingly and freely to us. Then we can give it to everyone else. And then once experience that mercy, then that's when changes in heart take place. I was reading a wonderful book last summer called The Road to Character by David Brooks, who's a New York Times columnist. But he gave some great insights into this drama, this dynamic working in the human heart. He talks about people of character, and I would say people of faith. When you experience these crucible moments, these moments when you really are brought down low because of your sins, because of your fragility, uh, or the disappointments and hurts you've had in life, 
the losses you've experienced, the broken relationships, whatever. He says in those moments, there's such possibility to come out transformed. We gotta live with the hope that when we're able to get through the self-deceptions and illusions of self-mastery, when all those things are shattered, that's when, when in our humility and our being humbled, when that self-awareness changes to the hope and transformation, that's when we get the, the picture. He says, Alice, you know, had to become small in order to enter Wonderland. And when we are able to quiet ourselves on that level, we open ourselves up so that grace can flood in. And when that happens, people so often find themselves helped by other people they did not expect would ever help them. They find themselves understood and cared for by others in ways they did not imagine before. They find themselves loved in ways they did not deserve to be loved. And they didn't flail about because hands were holding them up and they discovered that. And before long, these same people who have entered the Valley of Humility feel themselves back in the uplands of joy and commitment. They throw themselves back into the work that they were doing. They make new friends. You cultivate new love stories. And you realize with a shock that you've traveled a long way since those first days in the crucible. And you turn around and see how much ground you've covered and you've left behind. These are the kind of people, he says, that not only come out healed, they come out different. They find a vocation, a calling, and all of a sudden they commit themselves to some long obedience and they dedicate themselves to some desperate lark that finally gives purpose and meaning to their life. Now doesn't that capture the essence of a beautiful life? And I'm convinced that this year of mercy is an opportunity to embark on this journey. At the end of the gospel today, the deacon thankfully read the short version. He would have heard this of the long version. The disciples came back from that first mission, right? 72. They were so happy and so excited because they couldn't believe the miracles that, that happened through their hands, through their prayers, through their presence in these communities. And Jesus says, well, that's great, fellas, but don't be so happy about that. Be more happy that your names are written in heaven. In other words, none of us is just a number. Everybody counts. And truth be told, the Lord would like us to have more than our names written in heaven. The same Jesus who strengthens and commissions us today tells us clearly that the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. But that's why he's chosen you and me. That's why he's commissioned us in our baptism, and in our marriage, and in our priesthood, and our vocation, whatever that is, to win souls for him, to tell people that their love may be more than they deserve, but it doesn't matter. They're loved anyway. They're worthy. They're cherished. They're saved. And they're healed. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to work.